Well, good morning and welcome to the first meeting of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for 2019. Um, first item on the agenda is a decision to take uh, items 5, 6, 7 and 8 in private. Has the committee agreed to do so? Yes. Thank you. And this morning we turn now to item 2 on the agenda, which is budget scrutiny for the 2019-20 to 20 year. And may I first of all... Uh, welcome the two ministers who have come to be with us this morning. Uh, first of all, uh, Derek Mackay, Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Economy and Fair Work, and Jamie Hepburn, Minister for Business, Fair Work and Skills. And they are joined by Una Gill, Deputy Director for Enterprise and Cities, and Gavin Gray, Deputy Director for Employability, uh, it, both in the Scottish for the Scottish Government. So I'll first of all invite Derek Mackay and then Jamie Hepburn to make brief opening statements before we move on to questions from committee members. So, Mr Mackay. Okay, thank you and good morning, convener. Uh, this budget is in the context of continuing UK austerity, which has reduced a resource block grant by £2 billion in real terms over the last decade. It's also against the backdrop of a UK government careering towards any Brexit, regardless of the cost. So, this budget aims to provide as much certainty as possible for uh, business and the economy, uh, providing both stability and stimulus. Also making strategic long-term investments to strengthen and prepare the economy for the future. In terms of economic indicators, the latest GDP statistics published on the 19th of December show the Scottish economy continue to have stable growth for the fifth consecutive quarter. I would welcome the Business, Enterprise, Research and Development uh, bird, uh, statistics, which show that bird expenditure in Scotland in 2017 was £1.2 billion, the highest level since 2001, and up by 13.9% in 2016. In terms of actions, we've published an economic action plan in October, setting out the range of positive actions the Government is taking to deliver inclusive growth. Uh, in employment, the employment rate in Scotland remains amongst the highest on record, and unemployment rate is at record low. So the Scottish uh, budget will invest £5 billion to grow and modernise Scotland's infrastructure, including the creation of a £50 million town centre fund to safeguard and support the future of our high streets. So it will invest £8.3 million to further progress the new National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland. It will target up to £18 million in European funding to establish an advanced manufacturing fund It'll provide initial funding of £130 million to support the establishment of the Scottish National Investment Bank. It will commit over £187 million of capital investment in city, region and growth deals. It will invest £20 million over the next three years to enhance and intensify support to businesses wishing to export, and that's £5 million in 2019-20. In terms of a competitive tax regime, it maintains the most generous small business bonus scheme in the UK, lifting around 100,000 properties out of rates altogether, and it extends the transitional relief for the hospitality sector and for offices in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire. In terms of the poundage, of course, that's a, the property tax. The increase uh, in Scotland is capped at below inflation at 49 pence, and this ensures that over 90% of properties in Scotland pay a lower poundage than they would in other parts of the UK. Uh, the budget also offers the most generous package of reliefs anywhere in the UK, worth over £750 million. It continues to invest around £2.4 billion in our enterprise and skills bodies to provide that vital support required to realise Scotland's economic vision. And skills Development Scotland will receive an additional £22 million in 2019-20, taking its total budget to £214.7 million. And this will further expand the work-based learning opportunities available through foundation, modern and graduate apprenticeships. We will publish the Future Skills Action Plan in early 2019 to ensure that we have the right skills in place to support individuals, employers and our economy. Thank you. And Mr Hepburn? I would not propose to, to add anything to, to the Cabinet Secretary's open remarks, convener. Um, thank you very much. Well, perhaps we could uh, start then with a question from me. And uh, the Scottish Government uh, appears to agree with Scottish Enterprises' claims that Scottish Enterprises contributing to the Scottish economy positively. 
And uh, in, against that background, my question is why the Scottish Government then continues to reduce Scottish Enterprise grant allocation if it accepts that Scottish Enterprise is successful, um, should not money follow success? Well, Convener, there's a few issues there. First of all, Scottish Enterprise, unlike some other parts uh, of government or other agencies, can actually generate some of its own income, so it has the ability to do that. Um, there is a recognition, of course, how important the economy is, and Scottish Enterprise is key in that. The government does have to make choices, again, in that backdrop of overall um, uh, real terms reduction over the 10-year period, but we believe that uh, Scottish Enterprise can deliver the outputs that we've asked from them whilst delivering those efficiencies, and they believe they can do that through um, a headcount, through assets and property, and as I say, the ability to generate income without impacting on performance. Um, a very mindful of the range of actions we are taking to support the economy. A Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise, for that matter, are key players in that regard. So there's a, the totality of investment to support uh, the, the economy is impressive. You include uh, city deals and growth deals and so on, the Manufacturing Institute, but in relation to the enterprise, they believe they can execute their function whilst making those efficiencies through the areas that I've suggested. I mean, not everyone would necessarily agree with that assessment of Scottish Enterprises' um, performance, um, and they might think that cutting the budget is because you share that in spite of what you've said as the position. No, I'm uh, clearly setting out that I expect Scottish Enterprise to carry out the functions we've asked them to do, and they believe they can do that whilst making efficiencies and the ability to generate and realise income. So it's not a reflection on the organisation, it's the reality that the government has to make budget choices. And this is one of the choices that we make, that we believe that we can get the same outcomes and Scottish Enterprise, and I've discussed this with the Chief Executive of Scottish Enterprise, Steve Dunlop, believes that he can deliver those, those asks uh, whilst delivering those efficiencies. Well, a question now for uh, Mr Hepburn, and I think others will come onto this as well. Um, you're aware of the situation with Kayam and Livingston, and there, there's been other situations similar to this where companies have received funding um, through Scottish Enterprise or funding support. Um, is this a matter that needs looked at more generally about where these sorts of funds are put to the companies they're used to support and whether or not um, they could be uh, dealt with more efficiently to support longer sustainability of workers' jobs? Uh, well, thank you, convener. Clearly, the situation at Kayam is a, a very disappointing one. I understand that uh, the circumstances there will beget that uh, uh, question. Uh, our expectation will be that where Scottish Enterprise seeks to uh, provide any form of regional selective assistance, it should go through a uh, process of due diligence. Uh, that will have been uh, the case at Kayam, just as it would be where they determine that any organisation, any uh, company should be uh, provided with uh, Scottish Enterprise uh, funding. Uh, that will uh, include a, a number of factors, um, uh, looking at uh, finances, market conditions, uh, looking at the, the company's uh, business plan. So that will have happened uh, in the circumstances uh, at CAIM. Of course, where such funding uh, is provided, uh, of course, doesn't guarantee that in the the long run, a company will necessarily be successful. Now, that's not clearly when there's there's funding made available from Scottish Enterprise. It is on the basis that the due diligence has been undertaken and, and they hope that that will lead to ongoing success. Sadly, that's not been the case at CAIM. It can never be guaranteed with any foreign investment that it will result in a, a company being able to sustain itself for, for the long term, but clearly where there is investment there is an expectation there will be a return. Now, sadly, that's not the case at CAIAM, and now we're going through the process of supporting the workforce there. That's my primary concern in the circumstances we find there. So through our agencies, through Scottish Enterprise, through Skills Development Scotland, working with the PACE, a partnership that they are members of, we are now, my primary focus is ensuring that the workforce there can be supported. That's happened already. There's been a, a quick response in terms of supporting events that were arranged in West Lothian. Uh, there will be a, another jobs fair uh, arranged 
uh, later this month to support the workforce there. Uh, but after that, of course, Scottish Enterprise will be looking to see how they can recoup any investment they made in that company. But, uh, I mean, you have mentioned in your letter to the committee, and um, you are aware there are calls, that the, the background um, of how appro the approach is made to assigning such assistance generally should be reviewed. I mean, do, do you agree with that? Well, of course, uh, we have uh, made uh, a number of commitments around how we would expect, for example, through our Fair Work First uh, policy, uh, that fair work can be embedded as part of any uh, public investment that we make in any uh, organisation, any private enterprise. Uh, that's work that is uh, underway. So we are looking actively at uh, how we can have a wider expectation in terms of a return for public investment. And I'm also aware that the committee has undertaken a, a review in business support and will, of course, respond to whatever the committee reports in due course. Well, I'm sure others will, committee members will come back to that issue and the more of the specifics of Kayam. But I'd like to come to Andy Whiteman. <coughs> oh, thanks very much, <coughs> Convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, you mentioned you'd met Steve Dunlop to talk about these running cost efficiencies. Um, can you give us a bit more idea of exactly what these efficiencies are? You know, that would be more a matter for Scottish Enterprise to detail. Um, I, as I say, had sought uh, reassurance that they'd be able to deliver their, their functions as I've described and that that can be met within those efficiencies and ability to generate income. If you require more from Scottish Enterprise, then I would encourage you to, to go through Steve Dunlop. I'm sure he'd be happy to be forthcoming about how he envisages running his operational budget based on the, the budget that I'm proposing to Parliament. But it is in the territory that I've described to committee. I'm sure uh, Steve Dunlop would be happy to go through detail. At one point of uh, reassurance, I'm sure the committee would appreciate as the government has approached around no compulsory redundancy, so anything in relation to headcount wouldn't compromise that particular policy. They also have an estate strategy. I mean, all, all through government, I have a responsibility for the asset management within government as well, that you can always work your way through workplace um, uh, planning or asset management. So, so there's a range of areas that can be explored to ensure that further efficiencies can be met. But I'm sure that Steve Dunlop would be happy to engage with the committee. But I was satisfied with the assurance that I was given around a budget reduction in terms of that 3% figure, it whilst, of course, at the same time, the, the, the totality of uh, investments to support uh, the economy uh, is maintained, as I say, if you take just enterprise and skills at £2.4 billion. So this is an efficiency within the organisation. And is 3% um, saving through efficiency something that you would seek right across the public sector? There is actually a, a benchmark figure that is used. Uh, there's, there is um, the annual expectation that uh, efficiencies will be made around whether it's productivity or uh, procurement or just general efficiency. Indeed, we have an agreement with local government that local government makes an annual efficiency and reports that uh, uh, to Scottish government, and they do that every year. Um, however, that's not a consistent line to say that every part of government or every department has that equivalent level in terms of the budget allocation. The budget allocation is determined by a range of factors, but that's a consistent figure for the enterprise agencies, Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise. But you mentioned that the local government report that to government on an annual basis. Do any other public sector bodies, I mean, well outside this portfolio, um, report that or account for how they've achieved those efficiencies so that lessons can be learned? Sure, within the accountability um, of each agency, depending on the nature of the public body or agency, through their accounts um, or through the accountability arrangements to ministers, there will be a reporting of, of how organisations have conducted themselves. I, I realise that, but I'm talking about crystallising the actual efficiency Savings. So when you say in your budget in the level four figures this will be achieved through running cost efficiencies, um, it would be useful to know on an ongoing basis, year to year, not just in Scottish Enterprise but across the public sector, the nature of these efficiencies, how they've been achieved and any lessons that can be applied uh, in future. Is, is that not something that would be generally useful? Well, it would. I mean, leaders and chief executives of Scotland's public bodies and departments for that matter meet through the Scottish Leaders Forum and there is shared good practice in terms of efficiencies. 
whether, and you know, some of it might be straightforward, but whether there's an additional requirement to produce, you know, a report or a document, I'm not quite so sure. Um, but there is a sharing of practice of what, you know, good savings look like or what, uh, what works in terms of procurement or other areas. I can certainly give the matter further thought, but, you know, there is uh, there's a lot of sharing of information around the efficiencies that can be found within the public sector. Okay, just another small point. You mentioned £750 million pounds of reliefs on the non-domestic rates. What evidence is there that the Scottish this Small Business Bonus Scheme provides any economic benefits? This is a regular discussion that Mr Whiteman and I have at various um, fora, and I'm delighted to bring it to the Economy Committee as well now. Um, we have, uh, we haven't, as Mr Whiteman knows, conducted a government-led exercise, but organisations such as the Federation of Small Business have produced survey evidence as to what they believe that the Small Business Bonus has uh, done to support the economy for small and medium-sized uh, businesses. Um, and again, I'm happy to supply that survey output to this committee. Mr Whiteman will also know uh, that the government has committed to review the small business bonus and uh, the details of that um, can also be shared. Okay, thanks. Give it up. Thank you. Jackie Bailey. I think everybody would agree that we're facing a very tough economic context, particularly with the uncertainty of Brexit. So um, it was no surprise that the Scottish Growth Scheme announced in the programme for government in 2017 was widely welcomed. Um, imagine then our disappointment that only 0.5 million of 10 million allocation as part of the Scottish European Growth co-investment fund um, was actually spent. Um, and I wonder whether you consider that Scottish Enterprise just had their eye off the ball. I think, to be fair, there's a range of issues within that. And in terms of that particular fund, I mean, that's, that's part, of course, of the £500 million mm. um, Scottish Growth Scheme. Actually, over £100 million of that £500 million has been invested, but I accept the uh, element of the um, uh, the European scheme hasn't um, it landed the way that we would have wanted. I think we can all accept that that is disappointing. But there are different ingredients to that, such as a willing uh, uh, investor, such as a, a proposition, um, and then the government element of the scheme comes into play. I think it's true to say that um, staffing of this particular element has been, uh, or will be, uh, improved with dedicated um, staff working on it. So I hope that that does make a difference, that we can uh, invest it as envisaged. I am advised, though, um, by companies, not necessarily specifically in relation to this, but I'm, I no doubt it applies as well, that some investment interest is drying up because of Brexit uncertainty right now. Some investment plans are not being realised, put on hold because of the calamitous position that we're now in that we don't know what's going to happen on the 29th of March because of the ineptitude of the UK government. That is having an impact on uh, investment interest right across the UK right now because of that uncertainty. So that said, in essence, my answer to the question is there is dedicated staff to support this, but it is uh, the ingredients to its success will involve investment proposition, ready investors, and then the government and the European funding can come in to play um, and I hope that that is achieved. This is one part of the overall, of course, £500 million scheme. To the wider question, to want to make sure that the £500 million investments are made over the period, yes, I do. And I know I've committed to provide this committee an update by April, which I'll do, and it'll set out where we are with all the schemes and what we're proposing for the year ahead. I, I, I hear entirely what the Cabinet Secretary says, but it doesn't explain what's happened in the last 12 months, because there were people who were wanting to invest in preparation for Brexit. Um, I accept in the next three months it's going to be very difficult and challenging, um, but, but I kind of you know, can't help but wonder that this is a missed opportunity, that whilst there may be additional staff, you're describing yourself, that there will be issues about um, people investing. So how are you going to use the money? Will you divert it elsewhere? Will you ensure it's used? If financial transactions, for whatever reason, can't be used for the purpose to which they've been dedicated, yes, they can be used across government. And I have ensured that that's done so that we either carry it forward or we reinvest it elsewhere with the support and approval of Parliament, whether that's through um, um, 
budget uh, revision or so on. And uh, in fact, if you take um, financial transactions we've used for a support to farmers if they realise they can be reinvested in the economy. So I give a reassurance that financial transactions are not lost to us. The ability to, to spend them are maximised, either through the same budget exchange or through another um, um, good cause. So there's financial transactions right across government. So it can be help to buy, it can be support for farmers, it can be investment companies. They can be fluid. Now welcome that that they can be used in that fashion and then carried over. If ever I couldn't spend a particular quantum and had to hand it back to Treasury, that'd be an, an unacceptable situation. And something of course I'd engage with Treasury on. So I can assure the member Jackie Bailey that they, they are spent. In terms of that specific ten million pound scheme, I think part of, of the issue here is that um, I think part of the issue is the scale of an equity investment. So there are investments that are around. Of course, there's a hierarchy of financial support that could be provided to a company, irrespective of the Brexit uncertainty. And companies can choose which support they wish. Some prefer grant. Maybe that's no surprise. What would you choose if you were the investor? Will you take the money with conditions? Or would you like the equity? Or would you like the loan? and other companies have sought guarantees for different reasons. So I'm just saying there is, a, if you like, a menu of financial support that's there for companies in Scotland, some of which are delivered by Scottish Enterprise. And then, of course, there's separate Brexit support as well, Brexit readiness, uh, for example, to support companies um, preparing for Brexit, whatever that may transpire to be. But there is extra effort going into this particular scheme. In terms of time scale, I understand and I appreciate the disappointment. I share it that, that there haven't been more schemes that have been successful to come through. Some of that is down to the time taken for an investment proposition to go through the necessary process. So we would all hope that more come through the pipeline. But again, I say there are investors that have made contact. I understand that Brexit uncertainty is now casting doubt on their investment propositions. Now, we all know that to be true, that investment has been put on hold because of Brexit. But in relation to this scheme, the dedicated um, description, I think it's fund managers, I can come back with the detail, will absolutely try and be proactive to ensure that it's used. But I hope all of that answers, comprehensive it is, gives the reassurance that the resource is not lost to us. We're trying to take advantage of existing resource out there. Thank you, convener. Dean Locker. Thank you, Convener. The draft budget allocates £130 million to the Scottish National Investment Bank in terms of initial funding. Um, how much of that money is coming from financial transactions funding derived from the UK Government? £120 million would be the financial transactions and £10 million is the base operating costs that I've allocated. OK, so we've got the vast majority of funding from or in relation to the Scottish National Investment Bank and £70 million of the Scottish Enterprise budget is derived from financial transactions funding. When the UK Government announced this funding, uh, you described this as a con, as this not being real money. Do you still think financial transactions funding is a con? I think you're mixing what I said. What I described was that, uh, just as I've described what resources businesses would choose, any government would choose the, the financial flexibility of resource funding. Why wouldn't you? Because what I've described, and I think Dean Lockhart ma helps me make the point here, is if a government and a parliament has been asked to choose reductions in frontline services because our resource block grant is going down in real terms, that has an impact on the services of Scotland. And what I've said around capital investment, on capital investment, if you have traditional CDL, you can invest that direct in housing or wherever it happens to be. That's capital investment. Financial transactions are welcome for these kind of purposes. I welcome them to invest in the bank. I welcome them to support co-investment in companies or equity funding. What I do not welcome is a reduction in the frontline budgets, a reduction in the CDL grant, a reduction in the financial flexibility that we have to invest it in a very uh, tightly defined area. Any finance secretary would want as much flexibility as, po as, as possible so that we can invest it in the fashion it would like. So I welcome financial transactions insofar as they go, but surely with that wider context, committee understands that I would also welcome an increase in resource um, uh, spending so that we can invest more in areas like the NHS, education, local governments, so on and so forth. 
So what I described as a con is the way that the con some Conservative members were describing this £2 billion as totally unconditional £2 billion for the Scottish Government, when in fact a large amount of that was indeed financial transactions, but can, can which are very... Cash, well, that's, is, cash that's, is fungible. That's, the increase, that's, in, that's, increase that member financial. might not like it, but that's the explanation. It was £2 billion with strings attached. No, but the reality is cash is fungible. The increased financial transactions funding means that you can use cash that otherwise would have been going to the enterprise agencies in other areas. That, that's a case, that's just a simple case of financial management. But thank you for clarifying that FT funding was not a con. Well, I certainly can can't I... fund the National Health Service through financial transactions or the Education Service or local government through financial transactions. Yeah. That was my point about it's a con to describe it as unconditional money. So I'm glad to have been given the opportunity to clarify that. Well, good. I'm, I'm glad it's real money. Uh, moving on to a more general question about the budget, uh, the amount of income tax under the control of the Scottish Government is forecast to decline by half a billion pounds over the next financial year. That's almost ten times the amount that the Scottish Government will raise as a result of not increasing tax thresholds. Uh, can you explain the reasons for this half a billion pounds decline? Sorry, in income tax is forecast to increase. Um, according Shall we go to the tax chapter? Yeah, in income tax I'm talking about. Yes, yeah, so am I. Okay. What page are you on? Well, it's you that's questioning me, so you tell me what you're wishing to I'm probe. looking at Table 102, Scottish Income Tax, from 2018-19 to 2019-20, uh, from £12.1 down to 11.6. The... What, what's the...? Table 102 on page 8. And what do you wish to challenge? Uh, Scottish Income Tax. Uh, the last two columns going down from 12.1 to 11.6. In terms of the figures, uh, the member will know that we're moving from forecast to actual outturn. So the closest we get to each fiscal event, then we get to outturn. There's a two-year, 80-month delay in terms of income tax uh, figures being reconciled. So actually, we are moving from a period of forecast to actual outturn. So the policy decisions we've made will actually increase the Scottish income tax take. Right, that's not what this table says. As I say, we're moving from a period of forecast to actual outturn, and the more data we have takes us to a more accurate picture. Right, but do, do, does, is this table accurate and sh in showing a £500 million decline in income tax receipts? Mr Lockhart, you're a member of the Finance Committee, you're not? I used to be. All right, OK. So you'll be very familiar with the issue of us moving from forecast to actual outturn. That recalibrates the numbers, and as each year goes, we'll have the updated number. And, of course, we'd all like to get as close to outturn as possible, and that gives us the actual number rather than the forecast that we've mo been moving to. I can give a more expansive answer, of course, because we've published a medium-term financial report that gives us the latest numbers, and we uh, also will have... The, as I say, when we have the outturn, it tells you what exactly is raised up until uh, recently and now and going into the future, we rely on forecasts that are provided by the Fiscal Commission. The Fiscal Commission, in their very detailed report, have been going through what they've estimated uh, in terms of Scottish income tax. So they will move from what was their baseline issue, which was estimates, to the actual outturn. It has no detrimental consequences for the Scottish Government's budget and the resources that we have. So I know that's, that's the methodology issue that we were facing before, and they have revised the, the Scottish income tax figures. So that's the explanation for the difference in figures. We're moving from forecast into more accurate outturn figures. OK, but we're still seeing a decline in actual cash coming in through income tax. Let me move on to another question. The estimated number of top-rate taxpayers in Scotland uh, was reduced from 18,000 to around 12,000. Uh, the 18,000 number was in your tax document uh, of last year. Uh, what steps is the Scottish Government taking to increase the number of tax, top tax rate payers in Scotland? Because they provide a significant uh, percentage of income tax receipts. And do you think increasing the tax gap with the rest of the UK for those taxpayers will help increase income tax revenue from those taxpayers? Well, first of all, I've not seen any evidence that a divergence in tax policy is deterring people from coming to live, work and invest uh, in Scotland. I actually think that the other side of the coin, there's tax and spend in terms of spend, we're stimulating the economy, we're providing uh, that stability that's required and importantly the sustainability uh, of our 
public services uh, and the social contract in Scotland. So that's benefits that don't exist south of the border, whether that's free education, uh, no prescriptions, the extension of free personal care, or the kind of society and country that we are trying to build it is about raising the necessary revenues and then investing that in our public services. So I do believe that that presents a more attractive country. And as I say again, there's been no evidence that any tax divergence thus far it has in any way impacted negatively on the economy. In fact, you could argue in the current financial year that for the two quarters where we were outperforming the GDP growth of the rest of the United Kingdom, it showed that the economy was strong and it was no deterrence eh, eh, at all. That said, I said in my budget speech, and I'll say again, we must be mindful of the issue um, of a, a divergence, and therefore I've asked the Council of Economic Advisers to uh, continue to advise us eh, on, on those uh, issues. In terms of the top rate of tax, because that was specifically the question that Mr Lockhart had asked, we take an evidence-based approach. Uh, others um, may argue, um, I don't see any Labour members on this committee interest. Oh, sorry, I do see. Well, I know that, I know that uh, Jackie Bailey's... J J I actually do apologise. Um, I think the Labour Party should apologise for the treatment of Jackie Bailey, but that's a whole separate matter. <laughs> Um, I, I was just going to go on and make the point that um, if we had pushed the top rate of tax to such a point where it does deter people from living in Scotland, then there would be less resource raised. And I, I, I see that as, of course, um, something we would not be willing to do because the advice we were given is there would be that detrimental effect. So in maintaining it at the rate that we have done in terms of the, the top rate, we raise extra uh, revenue, revenue and, and, and it meets the tests that we've set out in relation to, to income tax. I had a discussion paper um, uh, on income tax and it set out the four tests, which is to have a more progressive system to support lower uh, income earners, uh, protect the economy, and that's a key part um, uh, uh, of that, and to, to raise um, revenues for our public services, so it's met those tests. In terms of how do we attract more top-rate taxpayers to come to Scotland, it's the kind of country you want to build. So that's a country that's investing in infrastructure and education and society and business, and is a fairer and more progressive society as well. And I think we have got a successful economy that will continue to attract people. And I continue to believe that the tax rates that I propose will not be a, de a deterrent to investment or to taxpayers living in Scotland. Okay, final question, thank you. Uh, do you have a specific target for increasing top rate taxpayers in Scotland over I the don't. next year or two? You I don't. don't. Not a specific target of top rate, right. uh, top rate taxpayers, if, no. If you don't have a target, how can you manage it? Well, I would like to hear the rationale for only attracting top rate taxpayers peers to Scotland because do you know what? I value the carer, I value the nurse, I value other people. I don't judge people just by their tax band convener, no, neither do by I their contribution I'm just, I'm to, about to society. Policy. Maybe even the size of their heart, something Dean Lockhart would be interested in as well. But um, convener, I have set no target to attract a particular band of taxpayer. But do I want to attract people to come and live in Scotland? Of course I do. Does the UK government wish to do that? No, they wish to send them away and create a hostile environment for uh, migrants to come and work in Sc Scotland and the rest of the UK. That's Something, of course, that would make a difference to our economy. Well, we, we have no one from the uh, UK government here to uh, respond to and rebut that, that comment. Um, Finance Secretary. So I think we'll move on from finance tax and apologies <laughs> to uh, questions which may be for the other minister to address, but I'll turn to Angela Constance now. Thanks very much, Convener. Before I uh, ask Mr Hepburn some detailed questions about uh, CAIAM and uh, RAC, could I just pick up one issue with the, the Cabinet Secretary with respect to financial transactions, uh, where earlier he gave an outline of the, the range of activities that financial transactions could be used for, and I wondered if he would be interested and what the Welsh Government have done to enable credit unions uh, to access financial transactions and whether that is something he would actively explore if I write to him uh, with the detail um, about that. Yes, I'd be very happy to, to look at that. Um, uh, Mr Hepburn has some responsibility um, around um, uh, credit unions. I'm more than happy to, to, to look at that issue, absolutely. 
Good. Right. Thank you. Um, I've obviously uh, spent uh, much of the last two weeks in regular contact um, with ministers uh, with regards to the devastating news over 300 workers uh, at Kayam and Livingston received uh, just prior to Christmas in terms of being made redundant uh, without due notice and not receiving pay before Christmas. Now, I accept that we know more about this company now than we did in 2014 when £850,000 of taxpayers' money uh, was invested. But can I ask uh, Mr Hepburn or indeed the Cabinet Secretary to speak more about due diligence given that this is a company that is persistently late in laying its accounts. It took me two minutes to find that out uh, on the, the website of the company's house and that they haven't seen an annual profit since 2012? I would refer back, I mean, clearly my, I would refer back to the answer I gave earlier in terms of my clear priority right now is as Ms Constance is as convener to, to support the workforce. But in respect of uh, the question that the convener uh, opened, up, opened up with, uh, I would go back to uh, the point I made there in uh, relation to the clear expectation would be that full due diligence would be undertaken by Scottish Enterprise in respect of any award they uh, made. That uh, should have happened with uh, Kayam uh, in terms of the specifics of the process that was undertaken. Scottish Enterprise would be able to give uh, a fuller uh, answer. But uh, the investment was uh, made back in 2014 on um, the basis of uh, seeking to secure some 103 uh, jobs uh, at the uh, site and um, the funding conditions were attached to those remaining in place uh, and the assets that were secured remaining in place until 2021. Now that's clearly very sadly not been able to be uh, achieved and on that basis uh, the Scottish Enterprise will be seeking to recoup its investment. So I would be interested to know whether the, the due diligence that was undertaken in 2014 by Scottish Enterprise, whether that will be made uh, publicly um, available, uh, particularly given that we know, as Mr Hepburn has outlined, that the purpose of that £850,000 was to create 103 new jobs and safeguard 65 existing jobs in 2014, yet by Christmas 2014, the company paid off 20 permanent staff and 40 uh, temporary members of staff. So despite being given £850,000 of public money with a view to expanding the business in 2014, the year wasn't even out in 2014 when the company was actually doing the exact opposite of what they were given that money for in the first mm. place. In respect of the specifics that were undertaken at the time, that's something we need to raise with Scottish Enterprise. So I can undertake uh, to do that and to see what information we can provide to the committee. It may be that the committee wants to engage Scottish Enterprise directly. My clear expectation would be that with any form of... Uh, public funding is provided by one of our agencies that full due diligence should be undertaken. So Scottish Enterprise have direct responsibility for that, so uh, they would be able to provide additional information. And in terms of follow-up, when public money is given for a specific purpose, but the reverse happens, uh, what do Scottish Enterprise and ministers do to follow up events that have not transpired as expected? Well, clearly there will be an ongoing a relationship between any uh, company there's been uh, investment made in and the uh, agency that's made that investment, in this case Scottish uh, Enterprise. Okay. Uh, where the outcome has not been as uh, expected, then uh, there would need to be the issue of clawbacks. So that's what I've uh, referred to already. The Scottish Enterprise would then seek to reclaim any monies that have been invested if the purpose by which it was invested has not been achieved. So in this circumstance, you know, ordinarily that would be through the company if the company was ongoing. In this circumstance, that will not be possible, so it will be done through the administrator. So we are now looking at the issue of clawback via the administrators because of events yep. leading up to Christmas 2018. 
Was there any suggestion of clawback um, dating to Christmas 2014 when I put it to you again, a substantial amount of public money was given to this company for the purpose of expansion, creating jobs, safeguarding jobs, but by the Christmas of the same year, they'd actually paid staff off. Were, why were we not looking, or why was Scottish Enterprise, uh, under the guidance of ministers, not looking at clawback then? I think that would be a matter that the, the committee would have to take up directly with Scottish Enterprise. I'm happy for us to take it up with them and to ask them to update the committee accordingly. OK, I will indeed take that with Scottish Enterprise, um, but I suspect um, you know, my, my, my dialogue with the Minister on this has is, is not ceased. Um, my final question... I'd be surprised convener. if it was, Ms Constance. <laughs> you know me well. Um, my, my final question, Convener, is how can conditions on RSE or, or, or grant funding be used to actually reduce the risk to the public purse and actually be used in a way that aids early intervention in terms of supporting companies or being on top of situations when there are the first indications that things are going wrong? Mm -hmm. Well, that's clearly something that we uh, can look at. I would go back to the point that I made earlier that we should be that ongoing a relationship. Now, I can't answer, and I've been quite clear and upfront about that in relation to what happened in 2014, um, but we will uh, look at that. But there should be that ongoing relationship between the body that's made the award and the recipient of uh, that award. In terms of how we are starting to look at uh, what we can leverage uh, in terms of uh, additionality out of our public investment, we have set out uh, the Fair Work First uh, principles, which are underway um, seeking a, a wider expectation around um, the commitment of any organisation that's a beneficiary of public funding to adhere to those fair work principles and uh, certainly uh, maintaining dialogue with your workforce about what's happening there, uh, I think it should be part of those principles. Okay, but there is evidence, looking at the history of this company, that fair work principles have not been applied, given they were given public money in 2014 to create jobs and expand their business, and in fact did the exact opposite. Uh, well, we will need to seek to learn from this uh, experience. Um, clearly, the manner in which uh, the uh, company moved into administration, uh, the timing of it, it was uh, very unfortunate, to say the, the least. Um, and. Uh, the impact on the individuals employed there is something I do not underestimate. And as I say, my clear priority now, yes, I've referred to the fact that the Scottish Enterprise will seek to claw back any public investment, but that is not their immediate priority right now. It's not my expectation that's their immediate priority right now. Their immediate priority should be working with other agencies to support the workforce there and indeed work with the administrator to see if a new buyer can be sought for the site so that we can continue to see economic activity in the West Lothian area. Okay, thanks. The Labour member of the committee would like to ask a follow-up. Thank you very much, convener. Um, just a couple of questions as, as follow-up to that. There was, of course, 100,000 given in RSA in November 2017. Um, what was that for? And is that also going to be part of the clawback that Scottish Enterprise come on to look at eventually? That, if it's uh, related to the circumstances we're in now, then yes, the expectation would be that there should be some form okay. of clawback. But I would need you to don't look know at the what specifics. It was for. I, I, I don't have the specifics, okay. to be quick candid. It, it would be helpful if you could write can, to the committee with those. That, um, yeah. I, I understand that Scottish Enterprise were told on the 16th of November, because this is an account managed company, um, the Scottish Government were told on the 22nd of mm -hmm. November. Can I ask when either the Minister or the Cabinet Secretary knew and what you did? It's, it's sorry, I found out on the 22nd, Ministers were informed uh, then at that stage Yes, there was certainly an indication, and this has been one of the difficulties in this situation, which I don't think has been um, widely understood or has come out in terms of uh, the coverage of the situation. Understandably, the coverage has focused on the impact on the workforce. One of the difficulties in this situation is the first uh, contact we had was, yes, certainly that the company was in financial difficulty, but they weren't moving then into administration. They were talking about seeking uh, a buyer. Uh, then. 
it would it change to uh, the company looking to secure new sources of finance, then it would change back to seeking another buyer and then looking for additional sources of finance. Indeed, uh, ministers were informed. I was informed just uh, two days before the company announced it was going into administration, the latest thing that the company was looking to do was secure new sources of finance to, to keep the company uh, going. So it was uh, a very fluid and um, a rapidly changing set of circumstances. But throughout that entire uh, process, Scottish Enterprise was engaged, the Scottish Government officials were engaged with uh, the company to do uh, to offer whatever assistance we could to try and help with the process of finding a new buyer, if that was what was uh, being sought. Or indeed, and this became clearer as we got closer to uh, the eventual outcome, that we started to gear up uh, pace uh, to engage to support uh, to offer the support of uh, pace to, to support the workforce so uh, the uh, process of engagement was was uh, there throughout mm -hmm. the, the entire period I'm, I'm sure you've expressed this the, the regret that staff weren't paid and were told on Christmas Eve mm -hmm. you know did you seek specific assurances from the company given the fluid situation that there was about protecting staff and their rights to a, a decent wage it, well, everything we were doing uh, through the engagement with the company was about trying to secure the rights and the position of uh, the staff. We were advised um, very late on that uh, the uh, salary that was due to be paid on the 21st of December... Beg pardon, sorry, we were advised uh, before then that uh, funds, limited funds were available to meet uh, the payroll, uh, but there was no suggestion that payroll wouldn't be met. We were then subsequently told a few days later that the salary wouldn't be paid as had been planned on the 21st of December, but would be paid on the 27th of December. And then it was only a matter of, in fact, it was the next day we were told they wouldn't be paid at all. That indicates the kind of situation so when, we're in. I think it is, know? of course, important to, to place on record that ultimately the, the staff were uh, paid. Absolutely. But when, when did you know? Because, I mean, that clearly should send up red flags about what was going on in the company. When did you know for certain that the staff wouldn't be played, paid? Uh, we were told, uh, I think, the day before they went into administration. That's when okay. we, we, okay. we came up. So that, that, that's the kind of time scale okay. we were working to. I mean, you'll, you'll forgive me for doing this, but I can't help but contrast seeing you both of you sitting there, that uh, Michelin and Dundee saw the Cabinet Secretary get on a plane to go to Paris to try and resolve this. And I just feel as if the Scottish Government have been sleepwalking and trusting Kayam, and it results in, in workers going without pay on Christmas Eve. Well, I think the situations were uh, rather uh, different. So doesn't feel that way to well, the workforce, I, I suspect. Of, co uh, of course, uh, it doesn't feel any different to the workforce. I wouldn't uh, suggest anything otherwise, uh, Ms Bailey. And I've made clear the commitment right now is to supporting uh, those people who have been uh, directly affected. With the situation with Michelin and the camera set can speak more to, to this, you had a company that was willingly seeking it to be engaged and had indicated very upfront and early on what the position was in respect to the future of that site, but indicated a willingness to stay involved in the city of Dundee. That was not the same with Kayam, but there was that process of uh, ongoing engagement with the company. And indeed, uh, ultimately, we know that the chief executive of uh, the company it uh, didn't uh, remain in Scotland to tell the workforce directly what the outcome was, but he was uh, at uh, various stages in Scotland and being engaged directly. Have you had any discussions with the Chief Executive directly, yourself? I, ha I have not, no. My, uh, I'm now seeking to engage with... Uh, I mean, the Chief Executive is no longer the Chief Executive of uh, the company, so I'm now seeking to engage with KPMG, who yeah. are the administrator. At, at, at the point that he was the Chief Executive, when all these problems were being experienced, I'm disappointed that you didn't engage directly with him. I would have expected that from the Minister and from the Scottish Government. It, well, there was engagement direct w between the Government and uh, the company. From, uh, from who? Yourself clear. as Minister? No, I've, the I've Cabinet said that Secretary? Very clearly from Scottish Government officials. Officials. Um, I suppose the point I'm making is that the situation it changed very uh, drastically over the, the months period. It only be was uh, at the ultimate end that. Um, it was very clear it was as drastic as it was. Now, that's not to suggest that the company hadn't indicated there were uh, problems with their financial situation. We sought to engage with the company 
to try and do what we could to assist, but it was only at the very end that, it, um, it, that the company it moved into administration and had said that the staff wouldn't be paid, that it was, it was as, as clear as it, okay. it is. You, you, you suggested to me, Minister, in one of your earlier responses, that you found out literally a day before they went into administration. I forget the precise timing of it. Um, you were briefed that it was going into administration on the 14th of December. Isn't that not correct? And would you want to correct your earlier response so you don't mislead no, the committee? Sorry, I'm not misleading the, the committee. So that's the point. So the uh, Kaiham had suggested that they may move into administration, but they then changed their position as far as we were aware to they were pursuing investment options to try and keep the company uh, ongoing. But on and the then 14th of December, you knew that going into administration was a live possibility and nothing was done. No, nothing. I'm not suggest, I've, at no stage have I suggested nothing was done. There was still that uh, continued uh, engagement. Okay, so you were reassured by them saying, it's okay, we're going to find other investors, and that was enough? No, I'm not suggesting that at all. The unfortunate reality, Ms Bailey, is that companies will engage with us on a regular basis. And very sadly, <coughs> and more often than not, it's where the engagement we have is not successful, you will hear about it. There will be other times that we engage with companies, and they will seek to do so on, uh, often on a confidential basis, because the, if the first thing we do is, let's say they are looking for another buyer, if we were to uh, go out and say this company is in specific financial trouble, it might make a buyer more, to, to, more difficult to be found, for example. So every process of engagement is designed to try and secure a successful outcome. Sometimes that's achieved, sometimes regrettably it is not. I think you know, people would expect people at the highest level, ministers, cabinet secretaries, to roll up their sleeves and get on with this. And I can't help but contrast that approach with the more proactive approach taken by the cabinet secretary. Thank you, convener. John Mason. Uh, thanks, Convener. I mean, Miss Bailey has strayed somewhat into my questions, but I was going to ask for uh, an update on Michelin in Dundee, if I, either of you can say anything about that. Convener, I'm happy to do that. Um, I think it is important to say, though, as Mr Hepburn has said, that um, there can be a number of issues uh, where uh, companies get into difficulty and Scottish Enterprise are involved. They won't be involved all of the time, but where we have an account manager, there's an expectation that we have we're informed uh, of uh, events um, and the timelines that have been set out uh, in, in relation uh, to some companies. I think it will give you a snapshot that companies can get into difficulty. There is sometimes an opportunity for ministers to get involved. Michelin is an example where there was clear opportunity for ministerial involvement and I think that that in that instance, was able to affect change because what we were able to present and understand with a company that was a, a, a quite an ethical company in terms of their approach generally and their, their purpose and their mission and their desire to do the best by Dundee and the best by their staff gave us the opportunity to engage. Ultimately, that's led to signing of a memorandum of understanding uh, with Michelin through what we're describing as the Michelin Scotland Alliance, where the company, the council, the Scottish Government, our agencies will come together to make the best of this situation. Um, as all members of the committee will know, we set out to try and save the plan uh, as it was, uh, and uh, we didn't give up on that mission, but it was clear that repurposing the plant was the more um, likely outcome of our discussions. Having met with the company, as I say, with other stakeholders, including the council leadership, the leader and the chief executive, eh, we were able to arrive at a proposition around the circular economy, the low-carbon economy, eh, retraining and eh, reskilling that can be housed eh, at Dundee. Because of the engagement that we had had and um, showcasing what we wanted to do as a country, uh, the company was willing to engage. Now, even though they've confirmed their plans to uh, withdraw the tyre manufacturing, um, of course there will be a reduced headcount as that happens, but there are full redundancy payments that of course have been welcomed by the trade unions. Um, we want to try and retain and recruit and, and attract as many people as possible to those new ventures. 
So Michelin have appointed a, a, a senior executive to take that work forward. We have the memorandum of understanding and we will have uh, dis ongoing discussions with the company in terms of how that's resourced. But we bring in our key partners together to make sure that that happens. That was all welcomed by the local community, by the trade unions and by uh, the, the local authority as other than actually retaining the plant, the best possible outcome in the circumstances, that essentially Michelin is here to stay in terms of ongoing investment and ongoing partnership. Bear in mind, this is an international company. You know, in the words of Scottish Enterprise, if they weren't already in Scotland, we'd be trying to attract them. So we didn't want them to go. So we've put up a package that encourages them in this uh, way to stay. Uh, so that work will now be taken forward, led by the Chief Executive of Scottish Enterprise. The number of jobs involved here, of course, was, was over 800 jobs. Uh, the scale of industrial manufacturing uh, in Dundee, it was about, I think, 8% of, of, of manufacturing alone just from that plant. And the plant had a, a strong record as an environmentally friendly plant in that it was heading for, carb heading for carbon neutrality because of the uh, renewables on site. So I think there's a lot of potential at the site. There's a lot of good work to make sure we can retain as many jobs as possible and even more importantly investing in the jobs and manufacturing of the future. So it will be repurposed uh, as we set out. I've been listening very carefully to the committee's questions around grant assistance. I can tell you this though, if all this parliament had done was demanded clawback and if that's all the government had done on day one of hearing of the Michelin announcement, we would have lost Michelin completely. Michelin are only staying because we engage. I'm not suggesting members have said we do that, but I make the point that somewhere immediately asking about clawback when there was something far more positive to be secured from the predicament that we found ourselves in. And I think that's why that positive partnership working, the, the engagement of the company, the, the willingness for them to listen to us, and then the proposition we put to them has led to a far more positive outcome than otherwise would have been the case. But of course, if there is to be clawback, if grant conditions haven't been fulfilled, eh, and in the most recent grant eh, around conditionality, around headcount, if it's not fulfilled, then yes, we, we have that clawback of resource that may have been drawn down. Specifically in relation to Michelin, I understand from a, and this is from memory, about a £4.5 million grant for environmental purposes, eh, £1.5 million was drawn down, and if you know the conditions aren't met, we'll claw that back. But we will be having separate discussions as to what we've set okay. out in terms of the mission, the yeah, mission okay. at Dundee. I'm but sure Mr Mason very finds full, that helpful. Full answer, yes. Well, you did was, ask. That was, um, I did ask, and I got a good answer, so I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I mean, there, is a, there does seem to be a bit of contrast between the two situations that we've just mentioned. And I mean, I, I noticed that you used the word ethical about Michelin. And um, it seems to me as an outsider, I'm not involved in either case, but I mean, they seem to have been quite proactive. They seem to have been quite upfront. Yeah. They seem to have been willing to engage uh, and call it ethical or, or whatever. Um, are these factors that Scottish Enterprise take into account uh, when they're assessing different companies? That, you know, is this a company we can basically trust? And I know you couldn't be 100% sure on that. And is this a company we have got reservations about? Are these factors that are taken into account? Convene, I, I don't want to make specific comparisons, but on the general issues, of course there's a difference if you trust the individual that you're engaging with. Of course we go through due diligence with every company. Uh, some companies are up for support and help, and some are not. Some companies are far more resistant to an open book uh, approach. They'll mm. share their accounts, they'll tell you the predicament they're in, they'll tell you their investment plans up front and honest. Some are maybe more guarded. So I think you do have to make investment decisions based on the information that you have before you, but there has to be an element of trust as well. Mm. And in terms of how much government and our agencies can do to support a company, there has to be a willingness and an honesty as well to get the best possible mm. outcome. Because that is this, what we had with Michelin. Yes, I mean, presumably this overlaps then with the fair work agenda that we are wanting companies to treat their workers well, make sure they've got yeah. women employees are getting an opportunity, yeah. but there's all, the, all of these kind sure. of things. So, I mean, if, if presumably it's the same kind of company that's going to treat its employees well that is also going to be open with you as the government. And if, if a company's not being open with yourselves, then that should perhaps raise questions as to whether they're treating their employees well and all of that kind of thing. Well, it does, and that, but I don't want to pick in any individual company when I say the following. Okay. Some companies are not well managed. You know, Some companies 
are not maybe forthcoming with everything they should tell, you know, Scottish Government or Scottish Enterprise, more specifically, or Highlands and Islands Enterprise, for that matter, about you might not be forthcoming with the nature of the problem. Some companies might not want the extent of their difficulties shared, and that's why sometimes there are discussions in confidence. Mm -hmm. We could do more harm to a company and its employees if we didn't treat commercial confidentiality seriously. That could put some companies at a serious disadvantage. So there's an issue of trust and honesty, transparency, accountability, everything you'd expect in due diligence. But there are also issues at a company level about quality of management, eh, the respect they show to their workforce, eh, and how open they are with government. So yes, it is dynamic, and we can only do our best, and our agencies can only do their best when they engage with companies, ask for the right information, expect due diligence. We're not satisfied, of course. We don't have to give public money, ultimately, if we're not satisfied. Mm -hmm. But always bear in mind the employees, yes. those people whose livelihoods determine on the success of that company. And that's why I just make the point that in Michelin, if my number one mission was financial clawback, there would have been a far less positive outcome than yes. the mission well, I'm we certainly not, I'm not I know you're not convener, but I'm yeah. making the point for the avoidance of doubt. Yes. When the government's mission is to support a company for the right reasons, that's what we try and do. But we do expect conditions to, to be fulfilled, yes. and we expect companies to act in an upfront, honest and transparent manner with us. Okay, well, I'd, uh, I'd just make the final point that, I mean, we have had reservations in the past with Scottish Enterprise, and to some extent HIE, as to how much they took on the government's fair work agenda, mm. and uh, all of these other issues about bringing in disabled employees and ethnic minorities mm. and women and, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and I, I do just hope that, that the message you're giving today, which is that these are absolutely central, will filter through to Scottish Enterprise, and I'm sure we'll raise that with them in due course. Well, Convener, I, I wouldn't expect the committee members just to hope. We're making it a matter of conditionality for the regional selective assistance, and then, as we've committed to, to work through all funding streams to make sure it is, you know, it is absolutely mainstream, but clearly we have to work on the big grants first. But if there's any resistance to it, the government agencies will be expected to deliver the government's policies. And the First Minister's made it clear, conditionality around fair work Fair work first, and that's what we're embarking upon. To make sure it touches every funding stream, as I've described, will take time, but we're working our way through that. That's the commitment. And if you hear any resistance from Scottish Enterprise or any other enterprise agency, I cannot make it clear that that's what we are working towards. And I hope, I'm not asking the members to hope. We will hold them to account for that. That's great. Thanks very much. Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, Convener. I want to move on to the um, general question about enterprise agency targets. Um, Scottish Enterprise successfully delivered all its business plan measures for 2017-18. Highlands and Islands met or exceeded all of its targets for the same year. At the end of the 2015-18 business plan period, Scottish Enterprise met all but one of the full three-year targets. Uh, who sets the targets for the enterprise agencies? What input has the Scottish Government in setting those targets? And are you satisfied that the targets are challenging enough to maximise the opportunities for the Scottish economy? Yeah, essentially, and of course this is changing, and that, that's just what I wanted to check. Right. Currently they're set, the targets are set through their annual plan, which ministers see and ultimately approve. Um, but the issue, of course, is that there's not a consistency amongst the enterprise mm. agencies. And there is an element of... Um, developing targets and then um, satisfactorily meeting them all. You know, is, is, is Scotland as a nation meeting our economic targets? Well, no, because we publish the uh, Scotland Performs documents and we set out uh, our own targets. They have, of course, in terms of targets, been impacted with the wider issues around the economy and right now, Brexit, uh, uncertainty and so on. But I think what, what will be helpful that we're moving towards, and I think you're taking evidence on this, uh, or will be as part of your work around uh, the strategic board, mm -hmm. is that the strategic board is looking at uh, having consistent targets for the enterprise agencies. And with the, with the strategic board looking at it, then I think it gives that level of um, independence of the board. And if you like independent government, in a sense, because it's the strategic board led by Nora Senior that will be taking that work forward. Mm. You mentioned about the national performance targets, and I was going to go on to that, that they haven't been met. How can the um, enterprise agencies meet their targets, yet the Scottish Government's national performance targets aren't met? Are because they not aligned enough? Well, I, 
I, I think it would be unfair, an interesting challenge to present to them, but an unfair challenge to hold the enterprise agencies entirely uh, accountable for the entire Scottish economy oh, and every part for it. Surely if we're asking the enterprise agencies to, to grow companies, to help exports, to um, deliver um, start-ups, scale-ups and all of that, at least if they can achieve all of that, um, that's what they've been asked to do and that is success. Mm. I did touch upon the wider issues in relation to the Scottish economy. Although there are many elements to be positive about, I'm well aware of the, um, the long-term targets that were set for Scotland, for the country. It is surely to be welcomed that we've had five consecutive quarters of GDP growth. Mm -hmm. If for some of those quarters we were outperforming the United Kingdom, unemployment is at a record low at 3.7%. Foreign direct in investment is only behind London and the southeast of England. Export is high, and we've made progress under devolution on productivity. Surely all of that is to be welcomed, notwithstanding that there are national targets that haven't been met that we want to meet. If you take the forecasts for uh, economic growth, if you want to define it through GDP, uh, they're subdued. But the Scottish Fiscal Commission said they're subdued largely because of Brexit, the population challenge that Scotland faces. So if we recognise that the population challenge that Scotland uh, faces is really an issue, we can't say that's just a matter for Scottish enterprise, Highlands and Islands and enterprise, or the South of Scotland uh, Development Agency, uh, uh, enterprise essentially to, to fix an isolation. So I think that's why there might be the disjoint between the two, but we absolutely want to make sure that the enterprise agency's targets are challenging, and I think the role of the strategic board in that regard will be very helpful. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Colin Beatty. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I'd like to look at really uh, Fair Start Scotland and maybe touching on one or two of the points that Andy Whiteman raised. Why is the Fair Start Scotland budget falling by 3.3 million between 2018-19 and 2019-20? I'm happy to refer questions for Fair Start employability to the relevant minister, which happens to be Mr Hepburn. I'm sure the answer is along the lines of that schemes are coming to... Um, <laughs> to, to come to an end, but um, I, I think it's more appropriate the Minister answers for this. I'll cover budget Absolutely. question, of course, but the Minister knows his brief. It's because schemes are coming to uh, an end. <laughs> uh, so uh, in uh, last year, for example, uh, out of that budget line, we were funding uh, the Innovation and Integration Fund, uh, which was some £1.7 million uh, to... Uh, road test the pilot, variety of different approaches as to how we can better align employability uh, provision. Uh, there was also funding for our transitional one-year uh, programmes because there was still uh, follow-on from uh, the year before where people had started. They were still uh, going through the, the process of being supported in the last financial year, even though uh, they had been referred in the previous year before. That's come to an end. So, uh, effectively, uh, in a nutshell, that's, that's uh, the, the reason why. Um, of course, it doesn't affect the uh, frontline service at all. Uh, the funding that we've provided for through the contracts, the £96 million contracts, that remains in place. The contracts are signed, and my expectation is that uh, what we've uh, put in place through the contracts will be delivered. And, of course, we are reporting on that. The first report it was published in November in terms of uh, numbers uh, covering the first two quarters. We had nearly 5,000 people starting in the service. Uh, given the, 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 the reduction for the reasons that you've said, is there likely to be more reductions in years to come because of other programmes that are coming to an end? Uh, probably not through that uh, budget line. Um, uh, and I would refer never to the... Never say never. <laughs> but I would refer to the... I would refer to the fact that actually, if you look at uh, um, um, other lines in terms of uh, employability provision, there's actually an increase uh, in uh, expenditure through uh, a number of uh, uh, projects that we're, we're seeking to take forward. So, uh, but no, in terms of this uh, budget line, it's been uh, contracted for the contracts are in place and will fund our contractual obligations. Is there a linkage between uh, the Level four explanation on efficiencies, the running cost efficiencies, in relation to this uh, drop as well, or is it entirely because of the programmes coming to an end? Yeah, there are, there are other um, if there are other associated savings which you would describe as efficiencies, but again, they were sort of upfront costs. So a lot of that was to do with uh, development costs um, that we don't now need to, to pay as much for because the programme's up and running. The 
Why aren't these savings being used to fund individual placement support pilot, specifically recommended by the committee uh, in their uh, report of 31st October and, and, of course, page three of the Scottish Government response? It, well, I'm... <laughs> We're already funding individual placement support, so individual placement support is an integral part of Fair Start Scotland. And if uh, the providers, uh, through the process of assessment of any participant, determine that that's an appropriate form of support, then they are contractually obliged to provide it. So I'm loath to uh, provide double funding for something that is already available through our mainstream employability programme. OK. In the, the programme for government, um, you know, information is given on the Fair Work Action Plan, the Living Wage Nation, Women Returners programmes, all of which are in that, as I say, in the programme for government. Given their importance to the government's inclusive growth agenda, why is the combined budget for these policies so small, £7 million pounds in 2019-20? Uh, I mean, uh, you, you could argue it's small. I could also offer the report that there's a 55% increase in the Fair Work uh, budget line, so there's actually been an uplift in funding. I think I would also make the observation that uh, a lot of the... Um, well, actually, I'd make the f first observation, if you look at um, the... The funding we've provided for um, living wage accreditation, for example, which is being maintained, that's led to significant success. We now have over 1,300 accredited living wage employers. We saw 25,000 people over the uh, last three years benefit by an increase in their income as a result of living wage accreditation. So we're offering the same form of funding, seeking uh, similar uh, outcomes um, uh, through uh, that particular uh, initiative. So even for what might seem in the face of it quite a modest investment, you can actually make quite a significant difference. So we've seen 25,000 people experience an uplift in uh, their income as a result of living wage accreditation. But the other more fundamental and wide-ranging point is that as we seek to embed a fair work uh, approach, not every element of it will necess necessitate new forms of funding. So we've made the point a number of times now around um, elements of conditionality through the uh, public investment we make into specific companies through the Fair Work First model. That does, doesn't necessitate uh, additional budget line. It necessitates a different approach. So much of our um, approach to Fair Work is predicated in that culture change. You, you also mentioned specifically, um, Mr Beattie, the issue of women returners. Um, I, I, I would argue we're investing in quite significant resource, £5 million over three years to support up to 2,000 women to return to uh, the world of work after a career break. But I've been very clear that if um, supporting uh, women to return to work after a career break is left entirely to the Scottish Government, then we're going to fail uh, in that challenge. We need wider buy-in uh, in relation to that. So again, that's about uh, working with uh, employers through uh, our agencies, directly engaging with uh, employer representative bodies, directly engaging with employers to try and embed that culture change as well. I hear what you're saying, and uh, it makes sense, but still, given the ambitions behind these programmes, seven million really doesn't seem very much. Well, convener, can I come in at this? Yes, sir. It's really just to emphasise what Mr Hepburn was saying. I, I don't think you can look at those figures in isolation. They may be for projects or budget lines or for our staffing, but the question is, are we using the £42.5 billion pounds of total expenditure to deliver a, a fair work nation? That means procurement, that means em employment policies, that means conditionality, and that means a leadership role with the rest of society, including private business. So we need to uh, ensure that, that those uh, principles have been rolled out as a matter of policy, not as a matter of individual projects, but a matter of policy. Last time I was at committee, the committee was quite rightly asking me about uh, why so few women get enterprise support, for example. So you, you, didn't, you don't need to necessarily set up a separate budget for that, but understand the reasons for that and then work it through. So I simply make the point that this is about policy to achieve our ambitions in terms of fair work as much about the, the financing, because if we get the policies right, then that is system change, it's transformational in itself, and of course working with um, other stakeholders, then ensuring it applies to the private sector as well, encourages that um, a 
best practices is why it shouldn't be judged by an individual level four budget line, but, but judged by the implementation of the policy, I suppose. Um, Jamie Halko johnson had a follow-up, I think. Uh, that's right. Thanks very much indeed, Kavina. Um, it's a question for the Minister. The um, number of uh, targeted uh, participants of 38,000 over three years. Uh, so far, the statistics, quarterly statistics, don't exceed uh, 2,815. So that would suggest that... Sorry. Uh, so didn't follow that last point. So sorry. Far. The, so far, the statistics that we have for starts... No, in none of the quarterly starts, the number of uh, sorry starts is to, uh, any more than 2,815. That would suggest that um, we're not, or the number of uh, uh, starts isn't going to mm. reach the 38,000 if that continued over the three years. So would, that suggests um, either there's going to need to be a large increase, or that the um, perhaps the target is going to have to be reduced. Would you expect there to be an increase in the number of starts? Uh, over the next three years? Well, we've set ourselves a three-year year, uh, target. We've not set ourselves uh, individual year-on-year -year targets. So 38,000 target over a three-year referral period and a five-year uh, delivery uh, period. Um, I would make the uh, observation that this is the quite early phase of the programme, so uh, it's, um, it's a new approach, so we're working with a variety of bodies to make sure uh, that they are well acquainted with what is a new uh, programme. Uh, the primary example of that, for uh, instance, is uh, we still rely primarily on Job Centre Plus as the referral uh, mechanism. We don't have direct responsibility for Job Centre Plus, so we have uh, an agreement with the UK government as to how uh, that relationship uh, can uh, be uh, managed. But we're working with them to make sure that we're maximising the number of referrals. But we're also working to try and ensure new referral pathways uh, as well. Um, now, that work is underway, but my expectation is that we've uh, set out uh, a target of 38,000 and we do everything to meet that target. So you're confident, confident that that target will be hit of 38,000 over three years? Uh, we've set the target and I want to hit it. Okay. Can I ask also, um, just uh, quickly, there are no uh, figures for job outcomes and early leaves at this stage. I appreciate it's early. When when would we be looking to expect to be able to get those figures? I think um, we're, we're still working our way through as to uh, what sensible stage it will be to start reporting uh, that information. I don't think it would be meaningful to rep have reported it at this uh, early uh, stage. Um, so uh, that will be available in due course. So the first set of statistical information was published in November. That covered the first two quarters. Uh, thereafter, we're going to publish information on a quarterly basis, and we'll continue to, to think through uh, what uh, additional information should be proactively uh, published uh, as part of those statistical uh, releases. OK, thank you. Jackie Bentley. Very quick. Question convener for the Minister. Um, Fair Start Scotland gets three-year contracts, employability fund, um, one-year contracts, so um, organisations are involved in an annual procurement exercise that is time-consuming and it takes them maybe two to three months where their attention is diverted. Um, the committee recommended three-yearly contracts. I have to say the Scottish Government response, if I was being kind, I would describe it as non-committal. So I'm always keen to give the Minister a chance to say yes. Um, would he perhaps now just say yes to three-year employability fund contracts, because that's the right thing to do? No. Um, oh, no I, 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 let me expand on uh, what would, uh, at face value, probably yeah, not seem a very yes. helpful uh, answer. Um, I think non-committal can be viewed as somewhat a pejorative term, but I would accept that in our answer we haven't committed to definitively <laughs> doing what we said. So um, I, on the, I'll accept uh, yeah. the good faith by which Jackie Bailey uh, used the, that uh, term. We are looking at this issue. I, I mean, I understand um, the practical difficulties that can be caused for organisations. I think my first observation, though, would be and we should always bear in mind that Fair Start Scotland and the Employability Fund are very different beasts. The Employability Fund is designed to be a much shorter and sharper intervention than uh, Fair Start Scotland might be. Um, uh, Fair Start Scotland operates on the basis of the uh, specific individual coming forward. It might be uh, a fairly short, sharp intervention, but a person can be supported up to uh, 30 months. So by necessity, those contracts have to be of a significant uh, length. That's not necessarily the same in terms of delivery requirement for 
uh, the employability fund. We're moving into a new world, uh, though. Of, uh, we've uh, I published on the 5th of December uh, the uh, first steps of a review of employability provision. We've signed an agreement with uh, local government uh, in terms of uh, working on a more aligned uh, and close uh, basis for the delivery of employability uh, services. So that um, the employability fund provision or that type of provision is very much part of that review. What I can say uh, very clearly in the review, we did set out how we would explore uh, how we could commit to multi-year funding at levels to bring added uh, stability. So it's in the mix in terms of, of what we're, we're looking at. The other thing I can say to add uh, certainty for uh, employability fund uh, providers is that for this uh, financial year, uh, we've uh, agreed with SDS that they'll roll over uh, contracts with existing providers to try and maintain uh, stability of support because we're moving into this this uh, further area of, of review. So hopefully that satisfies Ms Bailey somewhat. It, it's a maybe convener. I think, you know, the jury's out on this one. Right. Well, before we move too far into this new world in which uh, an SNP minister says no instead of yes and... Uh, the Labour member says maybe. I think that probably is a good point to conclude today's session. So thank you to both of you for coming in, and I'll suspend the session briefly to allow for changeover of witnesses. Well, good morning again, and uh, welcome to Nora, Senior Chair of the Enterprise and Skills Strategic Board, and she has with him Stephen Boyle, who is Head of the Analytical Unit, uh, Enterprise and Skills Strategic Board for the Scottish Government. So I think uh, I'll invite uh, Nora to make an opening statement, and then we'll move into questions from committee members. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. I have a bit of a cold. Uh, thank you very much for inviting us back to give us give you the or give us the opportunity to update you on what um, uh, has been undertaken since uh, we um, I was last here. Uh, the board has been um, in um, existence now for well I've been in position for about fourteen months. The board itself uh, has uh, been in existence since December last year, so um, just over twelve months. We've met. Uh, eight times during that period. Um, within that period, we've examined evidence around um, the uh, the or 
areas that will uh, help move um, Scotland's position both with, within the OECD uh, charts, if you like, um, and looked at um, actions around improving um, productivity, well-being um, and sustainable economic growth. Um, I think there are a number of areas that the board has uh, successfully achieved and happy to discuss those um, or, or outline those in more detail during questions. Um, the aims of the board were to improve the overall performance of the enterprise and skills system to drive sustainable economic growth, drive hard alignment between uh, the activities of the agencies, um, look at performance measures which would give realistic insights into and comparisons um, against what the agencies are spending money on and what the return on that investment is. Um, looking at um, how we encourage engagement with other agencies and bodies that, that are involved in the whole enterprise and skills business support area. And looking at the culture and collaboration um, of the agencies themselves. And I think that we can demonstrate a successful movement forward in each of those areas. Uh, particularly around alignment, um, we now have a more uh, coordinated planning system, I think, between both ministers, Scottish Government and the agencies. Um, looking at a process where there are um, a dedicated times for the agencies to uh, develop and discuss their not only their own plans, but share their ideas with each other, so that there is more opportunity for the agencies to identify where greater collaboration can take place, but also where duplication can be eradicated. Um, we are, we've made initial progress on um, measuring um, impacts across a number of different areas. Uh, we have produced and published our strategic plan, which was published in October. So um, a, that covered four main missions around um, a business models, workplace innovation and fair work, future skills, business creation and growth, and export growth. Growth, and there were um, we specifically we looked at a number of or a, a wider range of areas um, which we thought would impact on moving uh, the uh, or, or moving economic growth in a in a positive way forward. But we uh, selected these four as having been the ones which demonstrated um, as being able to deliver the most impact. We will be returning to the others that we didn't do in the first tranche uh, later in this year. Um, I think we've also been. Been successful. You had some discussions there around fair work. I think that we, uh, the board, has been more challenging around um, embedding fair work within each of the agencies themselves in terms of their culture and their values, but also within the plans that they are um, now beginning to prepare. Um, there is a significant num um, amount of data which the agencies um, uh, each hold. Um, I think the board has been successful in ensuring that there are ways and means that um, that information can be shared um, more easily amongst themselves, but also with, the, with importantly, with the analytical unit. Um, and most of all, I think that the, um, the strategic board has created a forum for um, discussion, not just with the agencies themselves, but with the wider, um, with the with the wider business community, with the wider learner community, and with those agencies and bodies and other organisations that are already involved in that area. So that would be my opening statement, and happy to take questions. Thank you, John Mason. Uh, thanks, convener. Um, I'm just interested in the kind of overall picture, and some of my colleagues will get into more of the detail, for example, on the analytical unit, so I, I'm tr going to try and not stray into their areas. Um, I mean, you mentioned quite a lot of things there um, about hard alignment and sharing plans and avoiding duplication. Can you say anything about timescales? I mean, you know, how quickly is it? I mean, a year is, is very quick, I accept. You know, at what stage can we say, well, we are making progress towards the OECD targets or, uh, you know, the, there is more alignment or, or these kind of things? Can you say anything about that? Well, I think that there are a number of... Um, the strategic plan um, actually has a 20-year range um, if you included all the actions um, and looking at, or, or you know, uh, being in the upper quartile of OECD countries is not going to happen overnight. There are some actions very specifically around hard alignment, which will happen very quickly. For instance, um, the, the culture and collaboration piece is very much going to be focused on the user 
not on the services that the agencies themselves can deliver, but what is it that the user needs. To help assist that, um, there is um, a, a group which is, um, is already working together, led by uh, SE, but comprising HI and um, SDS and, um, and Business Gateway, to look at a, a single digital um, online uh, point of entry, um, which will um, a, or is an initiative basically to be able to ensure that um, a customer is able to access everything that our enterprise and system in its widest context um, is able to uh, is able to offer the beta system of that um, it will be ready in spring um, and within the next month or so that uh, program group is already looking at how local authorities can also be involved um, in uh, contributing to that single online um, point of entry and I think that's really important um, so that has a very short time scale. The um, the the uh, our learning journey um, with uh, the, the change and the future skills agenda that we outlined within uh, the strategic plan. I think that will take longer to deliver because you can't change an education system overnight. But our education system and the way we learn um, needs to change to accommodate um, the the technological change that we are experiencing. Um, but also the fact that the the that work patterns will change throughout the next period. Um, we won't have jobs for 30 years. Uh, we will have jobs for you know, one year, two year, five years. Then there will be a continuous program of lifelong learning needing to upskill and reskill. Changing the education system and then the career system to support that is going to take slightly longer to do. So I think there are a range of um, a time scales that are embedded within the strategic plan. I think that the performance framework that the analytic unit is looking at will be able to identify identify targets against timescales more specifically. And we would hope that that, uh, or we've seen the initial draft of the performance measurement framework that we're looking at. The next discussions will that um, around that will be around, um, will be probably in March and then will be um, a, embedded and adopted. So we should have a fairer um, or more transparent overview of a timescale around various different KPIs. Okay, I mean specifically on the the different organisations working together, more or less duplication, kind of more joined up, if that's what we mean by hard alignment. <coughs> um, I mean, you were saying, you know, you've got your plan, and they're they're beginning to prepare their plans based on that. So obviously, that is going to take a few years. I mean, do you think we, as a committee, could, in in two years' time, do you think we could see a noticeable change in the kind of atmosphere and the relationships between the organisations and they're all really going in the same direction or is, is, is two years too soon to expect that? I would expect you to, um, or, or for the business community to be able to be coming back to you, or learner community to be able to come back and say, we have a no we see a noticeable difference in um, the way that we can engage with the whole enterprise and skill system and I would be most disappointed if it, if it was still being a question in two years. Yeah, that's, that's fine for us now, thank you. Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much. Uh, we've already started talking about the analytical unit and you've said that the performance framework, I think the first draft is going to be available in March. Um, could you say something about the, the resource that's available to the analytical unit, you know, the staffing levels and what size of budget it's got, etc.? Stephen. I'm happy to do that, uh, if I may, convener. Um, the board in May of last year agreed a proposal for a, an initial headcount of eight people and a corresponding non-staff budget of up to £800,000 per year. At the moment, we have five people in post. Sorry, I should say Scottish Government also agreed to, to, to that budget request. At present, we have five people in post uh, and expect to, to bring others on board. The five out of the eight that's currently been recruited, have they uh, been transfers from other Scottish government agencies or are, are the new people that's been brought in from business or etc.? So of the five, three of the team are employed by the Scottish government. So they either were already members of the Scottish government civil service complement or have been recruited to Scottish government specifically to work with us. So three of them uh, are uh, mainstream civil servants. 
we have one person who's on secondment from Skills Development Scotland, and I'm seconded to the role from the Royal Bank of Scotland. And the three people that have still to be recruited, are they specific uh, gaps that are needing to be filled in, in terms of expertise and in, in, in having an analytical unit that can analyse all of the data that's coming in about the Scottish economy? Yes, two of those are economists, mm -hmm. uh, and as I said, plans are in place to, to bring them on board. Uh, and one would be one would be either a statistician or mm -hmm. a social researcher. These are descriptions of roles in government, and there can be grey areas between them. But they would yeah. be either a, a statistician or a social researcher. Okay, that's helpful. Um, you know, we we carried out an inquiry earlier on uh, regarding the amount of uh, economic data for Scotland. Um, are you? Um, are you clear that there is enough data available to measure um, Scotland's performance uh, so that you can measure the outcomes of Scottish Enterprise High and the New South of Scotland Agency? Is there enough data that's, that's there? The state-of-the-art approaches to measuring the impact of agencies like these don't rely terribly much on conventional economic statistics. Right. If Perhaps I can give you an example that's live at the moment of something that we're doing that maybe illustrates that. In round numbers, about two-thirds of the budgets of the four agencies are spent on investing in people, whether that's uh, college and university provision through the Scottish Funding Council, or the apprenticeship programmes through <coughs> Skills Development Scotland. We believe that building a work that Skills Development Scotland started, we can estimate what the impacts of that investment are on productivity, equality and well-being, not by using conventional economic statistics, but by using other data sets that now exist that allow us to track people so they allow us to track people as they move through the education and training system so that we know what investments have been made in them, what qualifications they've obtained. But those data sets, when they're linked with others, then allow us to follow people into the world of work so that we can establish what impact undertaking the education and training has had on the likelihood of them being on work and on what they're earning. And none of that is in the conventional territory of economic mm -hmm. statistics that the, the committee has looked at before. Okay. So, um, in measuring <laughs> that progress, the, the example you gave of progress moving through education, etc., and that, then their career, um, how will you measure the impact of well-being, fair work, business models and innovation? There's no question that that's trickier. So, in a sense, the easy bit to measure, and it's by no means absolutely straightforward. The easiest bit to measure is the impact on productivity. Again, if I give you an example of how we're tackling the question of well-being in the context of education and training investments, what we're likely to do is to, to survey people who have been through the education and training system using the approach to the measurement of well-being that the Office for National Statistics uses for the United Kingdom as a whole and then to compare people who have been through the education and training system as best we can with people who are identical in other respects, and we can compare then the, the well-being of the two groups and measure the impact that proceeding through the education and training system has had on well-being. If I turn to something like the impact of the agency's activities on fair work, then we would adopt a similar kind of approach where we would observe what has happened to those businesses that have participated in programmes or received support from the agencies where fair work perhaps was part of the conditions of participating and compare them with otherwise similar firms that have not participated in these kinds of programmes. And again, by comparing the two groups, measure the impact mm. that, for example, in this case, 
uh, fair work interventions have had on those businesses. But to go back to my original question, you're satisfied that the ONS data, which covers predominantly the majority of the UK and is a small amount will relate to Scotland, will, will be adequate for doing that comparison purposes? I don't expect us to rely very much at all on ONS data. Right, okay. We're going to be relying on these different kinds of data sets, many of which have only started to be developed in recent years. Right. OK, thanks very much. Thank you, Colin Beattie. Thank you, Vera. Um, it seems to a large extent from what you're saying that this analytical unit is reinventing the measurements and so on that it's going to be using. To what extent can we make use of uh, other countries or regions' experience in this? Are we actually reaching out and looking at this as we put this, these models together? Yes, we are. I think there's a very great deal that we can learn from what other people have done. Um, off the top of my head, we can learn a lot in the education and training sphere from work that's been done by the Centre for Vocational Education Research at the London School of Economics and by the Institute for Fiscal Studies. Often they've done that on behalf of other governments or agencies, but they've often done it independently, so we can learn from them. If we think about um, assessing the impact of export support, there's good experience to draw on from Denmark. And we are very open indeed to, to learning what has been done elsewhere. One thing that we might well benefit from is that uh, the economics department at the University of Strathclyde has recently recruited a number of people who have got deep specialisation in the kind of impact assessment and evaluation techniques that are likely to be important to us. And we've had initial discussions with them about how we might be able to work with them and whether they will be able to support us in the work that we're doing. I mean, given that there's a wide variety of uh, organisations out there in Europe and within the UK that are trying to measure this data and trying to get to make some sense of it, are there, how are you determining which models are better than others? How are you doing that evaluation? If, if I take the work that I'd already described uh, to Mr. MacDonald, where we are trying to assess the impact of the education and training investments that are made through SDS and SFC, one of the things that we did was to undertake an extensive review of examples of people in other places and other countries trying to undertake similar kinds of work. And when we do that, I th we apply two filters to the, the examples that we generate. One is that we can use something called the, the Maryland Scientific Scale, which is a five-point scale for assessing the quality of a piece of evidence. One's not very good, five is state-of-the-art. So we look for those that are closest to state-of-the-art. And then the second thing we do is, using the skills and experience of people in the team, apply our own judgment as to what looks as if it's most relevant to us uh, in our particular circumstances. To reiterate the point, we are very open to, to learning from what people elsewhere are doing well. I mean, specifically, um, what have you learned elsewhere and what are you applying here in terms of the return on investment in enterprises and skills, enterprise and skills? The... I think the principal lesson we've learned is that many of the techniques that had previously been used in the past to try to measure the outcomes from these kinds of investments were in many respects flawed and inappropriate. But if with I can, the, If I can interrupt there, does yeah. that mean that previous data, previous statistics are actually not going to be comparable 
with what is being done now. In other words, any other measurements we've had in the past, you're talking about them being flawed. Does that mean that they're, we're not going to be able to, for example, take a, a, an average comparison over a period because you're reinventing the whole basis? Let me... Let me, let me just explain briefly in more detail what it is we're trying to do. The question that we're trying to answer in the example of education and training investments is for each pound that is spent on an apprenticeship or a college place or a university place, what's the return that we get at the end of it? And the reason that previous approaches to try to answer these questions were flawed was in no small part because we did not have the data that would allow us to answer the question. The, the type of approach that I outlined to Mr Macdonald deploys data that until very, very recently just didn't exist. So if we had been before you two or three years ago, we would not have been able to talk to you about the, the ways in which we're going to use data of these kinds. So. We hope to move beyond the approaches of the past to give different, I think, better answers to this return on investment question. And you're right, those answers won't be comparable with what you might have seen before, but I think they will be more reliable answers. But as with all statistics, until you build your statistics over a period, you don't see, you can't do trend analysis, you, you, you don't really get the picture, you get a snapshot. That's correct. So you have to wait for the trend analysis. Again, if I take the example of the, the education and training analysis that we're doing, I think I'm correct in saying that we are now able to follow people who have been through the education and training system in the past up to about their late 20s. So we have we've begun to build that time series, or others have begun to build that time series. But you're correct, we won't get much longer trend data for some time. Thank you. Uh, Jamie Halker Johnson. Thanks very much, Convener. Good, uh, good morning. Um, still just about good morning. Can I ask you a question? I, mean, I was largely going to, uh, I think, focus on some of the areas that Conor Beatty's just covered. So can I expand that a little bit and look at kind of responsibility and accountability and, and I suppose, process? Um, looking at the kind of me measure, measuring return on investment uh, of enterprise and skills policy, um, one of the things that came up this morning again um, uh, was the... Um, uh, Scottish Enterprise suggestion that every pound spent results in six to nine pounds of G GVA. And while some may agree or disagree with that, I was wondering if that was something you agreed with. <coughs> also, if um, obviously the enterprise budgets are being cut, if you had a concern about cutting budgets when, um, while accepting uh, potential for GVA growth, how you would put that across, what the processes would be um, to make that known to government and to the enterprise agencies, but particularly government. Okay. So, um, the, as maybe I'll kick off and then um, Stephen can follow up with any other um, comments. Um, to take your first point about Scottish Enterprise um, and the, the return on investment, one of the challenges that we have, uh, or that the board has put to the agencies, is that um, they are um, measuring themselves and their targets against those companies and people who are already involved with the system. So to an extent, they are already people who are, or companies that are um, a, you know, on a, a trajectory. The big challenge for, um, for the agencies is to reach those people who are not yet engaged in the system, because that's where actually the greatest growth could perhaps come. And that would, if you then bring in people who have not been in that kind of marking system before, then it would change um, the return on investment that is that is um, is being there. So do I agree with what uh, the agencies are putting forward at the moment within the context of what they're marking? Then... I still think it is very, um, a, it's a, a, a more than an excellent return. Um, do I think that actually, it, you know, it hasn't then resulted in an overall shift in, in productivity or economic growth because there is still too large a number of um, customers who are out there who are not engaged with the system at all and who would benefit from um, greater help. So that's one of the tasks that is going to be set by the board to the agencies in order to widen their, um, their customer base. The second 
point, um, to what Stephen has said is, you know, the strategic board, um, it's not an operational board. Um, therefore, the targets and the measures that we'll look at will be at the micro level, uh, the macro level, where we will will look at the shift in uh, productivity, inclusivity, um, equality measures, growth in economy, how many companies are moving into um, moving up the, um, the the growth scale. If all of those metrics, those top line metrics and measures, um, if they show that nothing is moving, then that's when the board will go back and challenge the agency agencies to come back and explain um, and be able to demonstrate why um, particular budget lines are showing growth and particular budget lines are showing no growth. And the challenge then would be from the board to say, well, why are you can why you need to explain and evidence why you have continued to place money and investment in those areas without there being a, 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 an acceptable return on that investment. The board would challenge the agencies to do that and challenge the own agencies' boards to then um, revisit that and to uh, to be able to come back and, and um, support why they've chosen to, to look at um, investing in those areas. That then gives an opportunity for review as to where investment is currently being made and could it be potentially be uh, better placed. Um, and I think that um, in each of the missions, um, there is uh, the board will be looking at the types of targets from a, um, a, an overall Per macro perspective that then has to be taken by the agencies and deployed through each of their individual plans. Thank you for that. I mean, you talk about greater help, but but a greater a greater help being required might require at least the same budget. So, when do you? Where is there a role for you challenging perhaps the government if you disagree with the cuts that they're making and that the limit and how that might limit in terms of providing that greater help? I, th I think you know we have to uh, discuss through um, the various ministers who are responsible for the agencies um, and make some recommendations. It's not in our gift to make those budgetary decisions, but we can certainly make informed recommendations around where we think investment ought to be made. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. you know, uh, this committee issued a report last year on the economy, which expressed some concerns that. Uh, the enterprise agencies were marking their own homework when it came to setting and uh, achieving performance targets. Uh, do you share these concerns and how will the performance targets be set going forward? Will we see more transparency? Um, I think I've probably potentially answered that in that I think there is um, the process, the planning process which is being put um, forward together. The strategic plan has been created. All of the agencies are developing their um, their own individual plans around those missions as well as the other areas that they cover. Um, there is an approach where um, the agencies will, will hold themselves to account because they will have to share their plans before they're published, which previously hasn't happened. Um, um, they will also have to, or we are suggesting, um, and this is still to um, this is still to be decided at our January meeting. But the, I am anticipating that the process will be that um, not only will the agencies share uh, their own plans with each other, they will be looked at obviously and reviewed by their board, but they will also be reviewed by the strategic board, particularly the business members among uh, the um, uh, the board, uh, before they are. Um, before before they are signed off. So I think that there should be greater transparency and understanding around the targets that are being set. And I think that the, um, the performance framework, which has been developed by the analytical unit, will also allow greater transparency around comparisons, not just GVA, but the other elements that, that Stephen has referred to, um, which will make it easier for us, or, or it will be more transparent for ministers to be able to make decisions around um, where budget sought to be placed. Is there any plan to publish, make them public, the uh, performance targets of the enterprise agencies? Well, I think the performance targets, um, each of the agencies publish them in their own um, business plans. <laughs> So um, my, my understanding is the top line targets are published, but there's like the Scottish Enterprise has, I think, 72 from memory, 72 different targets. I don't think that level, the second level of targets, are, are made public. I can't answer that. No. And, I, and I'm not aware, but I'm certainly willing to go back and, and have a look at that. The performance targets that the that the um, that the board will set will be around the macro level. The more operational targets would have to mm. be set by the agencies themselves. Um, 
but you raise a good point, so let me consider that and feed that into the um, discussions in January around targets and how they are reported. Thank you. Uh, just a related question. The Scottish Government has recently moved away from a policy of setting specific economic targets. For example, no longer saying that productivity should increase to the first, first quartile. Um, in the absence of specific economic targets, does it create difficulties for the strategic board in setting your own targets when you don't know what the overall microeconomic targets are in each of those economic components? Um, I think that I'll, I'll let uh, Stephen perhaps answer that. My my own observations on that is is that you know the um, we are target our, our aim is inclusive economic growth. Therefore, it is not just about economic growth and GVA or GDP itself. There are other areas around well-being, around health, um, around workplace innovation, etc., which are all indicators that an economy is moving in a positive direction. Um, so, I think that th that that's the type of um, those are the type of criteria which are included within the performance framework which the analytical unit is looking at. Stephen, is there anything you want to add? I mean, the, the board retains the desire to see Scotland achieve top quartile performance in each of the, the areas of importance to it, productivity, quality, well-being and sustainability. And I expect at the moment that will continue to guide uh, the approach that the board takes. Um, you mentioned inclusive economic growth. It's something we've mentioned before as uh, lacking definition, certainly previously. Is there now an agreed definition of what inclusive economic growth is and how it can be measured? Well, I would have to say no, because I think if I asked five different businesses or five different government officials or five different um, uh, politicians, then each of us would probably use different words and a different definition. Um, I actually think that is part of the challenge. You know, when we talk about inclusive economic growth and fair work, this is where particularly businesses get confused about what it is that we're actually talking about. And it sounds like a government mandate, where actually what we're talking about, you know, is actually good working practice. So if you ask somebody uh, in business, you know, we do would you um, be uh, willing to look at um, a, you know, a workplace wh where you include your workers, give them a voice, um, look at um, equal opportunities, etc.? Most of them would say, yes, of course. They think, you know, mo the majority would think they're doing it, but because we put a, a name on it like fair work, people think, oh, well, that's something that, you know... But so I think we need to... Um, I think the language... Uh, that all of us use needs to be much more consistent rather than... Um, so I think collectively we, we need to look at um, a definition. I mean, we will certainly be looking at you know words that, that the strategic board will be using, which will be embedded in the agencies. Um, in terms of you know, in terms of the fair work discussion, uh, I think what was what came across to the board was that um, even within the agencies, uh, the understanding of inclusivity and fair work was not was different between each of the agencies. So we are going to be looking at a consistent um, approach and form of words which the agencies will all buy into, and that will be embedded within the culture and collaboration piece of work. Thank you. Final question. Uh, the SFC has forecast GDP growth of around 1% for the next four years. Just briefly to get your views on how far off that is in terms of trend growth and Scotland's potential. So how far 1% is off? How, how much it diverges from trend growth and Scotland's potential? Over a long period of time, so between 50 and 60 years, Scotland's probably grown at an average annual rate of just south of 2%. In the 10 years after the financial crisis, I think we grew in total by about 1%. Um, so the, the Fiscal Commission's projection of 1% a year over the next few years is materially better than the immediate aftermath of the financial crisis, but materially poorer than the longer-term trend. So 1% is the new normal? One of the things that we can observe across most advanced economies is that there appears to have been a step-down in the rate of growth, a step-down that predates the financial crisis that probably happened towards the end of the 1990s and the early part of the 2000s. Despite what we all read and sometimes some of us say about the pace of change and so on, 
that's not manifesting itself in productivity growth across uh, much of the Western world. And Scotland is part of that story with the added factor in Scotland of slow population growth. I think also just to add to that, you know, there are um, th there are other external factors like Brexit, and don't want to bring in the Brexit debate, but you know that will have that could have a considerable impact, as will technological change, mm. and the um, ability of um, both businesses and uh, our education system to adapt uh, to uh, digital disruption um, and climate change. I think that there are elements out there that um, it, it it would be difficult to say any of those could have a more severe impact, which would um, would impact on your 1%. Thank you. Jackie Bailey. Um, the Enterprise and Skills Review didn't include consideration of Business Gateway, um, yet the board quite rightly identify one of their, their missions as business creation. Um, how can you influence what goes on in Business Gateway? Well, uh, again, looking at it from uh, the user perspective, um, you know, business creation is absolutely critical. If we don't have enough businesses being created, we don't have enough moving into the middle bit and onto being, and we have too much of a, um, uh, or, or we rely too heavily on a small number of large companies. So we need the pipeline to be bigger. So we quite likely, quite rightly, I think, recognise the really important uh, role that business gateway plays. Um, to that, to so much so that um, in our November uh, meeting, we we invited both Business Gateway um, and Slade along to our board meeting, um, so that we could have an open discussion about how the agencies and the enterprise and skills system can work much more cohesively. Um, businesses will start off through the Business Gateway doorway, but there needs to be a better cohesion and better customer experience of moving through the system at the right time, so that they they move from you know, re local to regional to national in a seamless um, a transition rather than a disjointed transmission. But I would also say that you know, that kind of disjointed journey also then goes back not just through those agencies, but then um, for me looking at it as an outsider um, in the portfolios of where each of those um, agencies sit. So to an extent where you have division around um, you know, budgets and, and delivery, um, then, um, then you there is the the, uh, the there is a, the 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 challenge of disjointedness. So I think that you know business gateway um, there needs to be, and this again is embedded within the culture and collaboration um, piece. It's not just looking at the agencies working amongst themselves, but it is looking at local authorities and business gateway regional economic partnerships. And again, that's why we made the recommendations within the strategic plan about closer working relationship and how can that journey um, be more streamlined, not just for the user, but also internally. But the user is the most important. Mm. I think it, it, certainly in the evidence given to committee, we would regard the, the performance as patchy if I was uh -huh. being kind. And I just wonder if there is a role for the analytical unit in just looking at, at some of the data that underlies performance mm. that would give us an in into how to lift the standards across Scotland. Mm. We would be open to that. I've had one initial discussion with Business Gateway about <coughs> its approach to evaluating its impact. Um, we are not at the position at the moment of being able actively to help them, but I'm certainly open to doing that in the future. It's very helpful. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Uh, Angela Constance. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, Ms. Senior, in your opening statement, you uh, said that the, the board is now much better placed to really challenge uh, agencies on the implementation of fair work. And throughout this morning's meeting, you've spoke, uh, both witnesses have spoke a lot about the availability uh, of data and uh, the importance of uh, scrutinising that data. Um, I'm conscious that um, your guest speaker, uh, Patricia Finlay, to your board meeting in August, um, said that the system, e.g. business support, is not set up to support fair work. The value of adopting fair work is recognised and accepted, but not mainstreamed. So I wondered whether the board agreed uh, with this assessment, uh, and if so, why that is the case, considering that fair work has been a, a government priority since 2015. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a very fair, fair comment. And I think that you know what um, uh, what Patricia Finlay said um, is completely right. That fair work is not mainstreamed. I don't think it's mainstreamed in the agencies, and I don't think it's um, mainstreamed in our, our businesses. Partly for the reasons that I mentioned before, because businesses don't really understand what it means. So, um, you know, one of the, the, four, the board's four missions was on, um, you know, business models, workplace innovation and, and fair work. And fair work, um, the board is completely, um, you know, behind it. That must be central to everything which, which is being done. And we were fortunate enough to draw on, um, on Pat Finlay's advice in developing our proposals uh, within that area. And um, we set a number of actions for the agencies in, in that area. First, was uh, to deliver a campaign to promote understanding of uh, the possible impacts and productivity if they if if uh, or through the adoption of fair work workplace innovation um, and, and um, different business models um, the second was uh, building on the Scottish manufacturing advisory service uh, their diagnostic model to identify businesses that can benefit from innovation and adoption of better working practices um, through the, the fair work model um, developing new cross agency teams which will drive the adoption in fair work um, and other management practices. Um, I think I think it was the cabinet secretary um, when he was talking about um, fair work. I think it was to to, to your question. Um, and those businesses do um, you know are those the ones that fail because they're not more transparent? I think the business manage or management practices can be very poor across some um, businesses within Scotland. So I think the communication, creating new cross-agency teams that will deliver a consistent message around fair work will be really important. Um, and again, we did make the recommendation to government that any uh, support which comes from the agencies should have the conditionality of fair work practices as, as a condition. And I wondered, um, where does social partnership sit? With, with, within all this. I mean, I'm very conscious that the STUC and Jim Mather led a bit of work and reported on their findings, the, the Working Together uh, report, and given the links between good social partnership and, 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 and productivity, I wondered you know, what your assessment is of how well placed Scotland currently is in terms of really beginning to motor ahead with social partnership or whether we are still some some distance from the races? Uh -huh. um, well, I think that Scotland benefits from the size and scale that it is and um, has more of an opportunity to be able to um, engage and have dialogue, dialogue with a, um, a much wider bank of stakeholders than many of our competitor countries. Um, I do think that the Strategic Board has um, acted as a catalyst for dialogue between um, not just the agencies themselves, but also a wider um, bank of um, organisations. So I think that there, there is the potential for that to, um, to grow and that engagement to continue much more widely. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Convener. In response to an earlier question from Jamie Halker Johnson around the budget, you said rightly you don't make any budgetary decisions, but um, did you make any recommendations to the Scottish Finance Secretary this year regarding the budget? Um, in truth, um, not really. Uh, not in terms of the pounds, shillings, and pence, um, but in the areas that we made very strong recommendations around the areas that. Um, uh, or around the missions and where um, we thought the emphasis ought to go, which was um, in the main um, around uh, the, the um, business models, workplace innovation and, um, and fair work. Uh, but we didn't give uh, indications around the budget. We've left that, to, we have tasked the agencies themselves um, to look at how they are going to use their budget collectively. Um, and SFC is looking at how it can um, use more of or some of its budget uh, to give to SDS around um, career progression, upskilling, reskilling, and how. It, so there will be the agency. The task is for the agencies themselves to take on that as a responsibility and then bring that to the board for um, discussion and review. You, you mentioned um, the Scottish Funding Council and South of Scotland Enterprise. Was it? No, S SDS. Sorry. Scottish. 
Skills Development Scotland. Skills Development Scotland, I apologise. Um, is, is there going to be more flexibility around the transfer of money between the agencies that you coordinate, or is that th not a discussion that's happened? Um, we haven't considered that as yet. The board is meeting in, at the end of January to discuss its priorities for the next two years. Um, I think that within that, there will be a discussion around for the agencies through their... Um, their uh, uh, we are tasking them to be able to demonstrate where greater collaboration and shared resources is happening. Therefore, the movement of bud budgets, which is outside our domain, will have to be decided between um, the agencies, their government sponsors and by ministers, I would suspect. But you're, you're looking at that in terms yes, of we are looking efficiencies, at which yes. we discussed with the Cabinet Secretary this morning. Um, what's the role of the board with regard to the Scottish National Investment Bank? Um, we... Um, we talk to them, we make recommendations, their work will be of interest to us. Um, um, there will be areas of um, investment around infrastructure and perhaps exports, um, which we would want to feed into. But we are, we would, we don't have any formal relationship. That would be a, a Scottish government or ministerial decision if we were to. Okay, thanks. And just turn to some of the kind of future challenges in relationship to enterprise and skills. I think you've already hinted at things like population, Brexit, climate change, um, etc. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not asking you to take out a crystal ball or anything like that, but you <coughs> mentioned at the beginning that some of the time skills you're working to are 20 years. You mentioned changes in people's expectations about what a job is uh, and how long it might last and what might be required in terms of um, sustaining uh, employment by people. What are the key challenges, do you think, in terms of the in enterprise and skills environment over the next 10 years? Um, skills, I think, will be is a major one because I do think that you know there are many opportunities which we, which Scotland as a country needs to um, be very fleet of foot on. Um, both in terms of um, manufacturing, um, development, um, exports, uh, upskilling and reskilling, digital disruption is all going to impact on um, on how Scotland performs. So, um, the ability to have a flexible education system which can look at uh, both demand-led um, uh, jobs, but also create new higher value innovations um, is going to be one of our, our, our key challenges. You mentioned digital disruption. Can you say anything more about that? Well, automation within... There are still many of our um, particularly manufacturing industries in Scotland uh, which could benefit from um, more innovative adoption of, of digital technology or technologies. Um, that should be one of the, and many of those companies are not yet using, are not yet engaged really with the, the enterprise and skills system. So again, it goes back to the challenge I mentioned at the outset. The challenge is not just working with those companies who are already in the system, but those who are not yet engaged in the system. And has the board or any of the agencies that you work with made any preparations for a no deal Brexit? Yes, um, we had a presentation in November very comprehensively of a collective um, a response to a Brexit and a number of different scenarios. Um, and there is a very comprehensive website which the agencies have collectively launched to deal with, with Brexit and queries round about Brexit. Part of the challenge is that, that business is very um, ambivalent about um, responding and is, is rather closing its eyes. Rather, And so I think, depending on what happens at the end of March, there's, there, there's going to be a rush to the agencies to, to give them assistance, which is why um, the board had... Um, um, had uh, a task the agencies with a collaborative uh, Brexit response. Okay, thanks. Thank you. And perhaps just on one of the points you raised about automation, and I think probably from what I understand, at least we're behind in this country where many <coughs> European continental countries would be. Have you identified a way Scottish companies can be encouraged to uh, automate more? And that doesn't necessarily mean loss of jobs, of course, because when automation is introduced, often that can increase production and result in more jobs. Um, do you have a, a view on that at this stage? Um, we haven't got um, a 
the board hasn't seen evidence round about that. Um, I mean, the analytic unit will be looking at um, innovation. Well, the board, one of the areas that we will be looking at um, that we didn't look at the first time was around innovation and research and development. Um, the analytic unit is preparing some of the background information around that area, um, which takes into account those companies already benefiting from um, digital technology in um, adoption and those who haven't, and doing comparators around some of the um, other OECD countries. That piece of work won't be ready till between March and the middle of the year. And um, you talk about um, digital, but I'm, I'm thinking also of actual automation, so using well, machines sorry, to I, I, do I did work. Mean, I, did mean I mean, digital is part of that, yeah. of course, because you can't I really separate both. the two these days. I, I did, I, well, going back to the Scottish manufacturing, um, uh, their advisory mm -hmm. model, um, they're already looking at um, uh, companies that are benefiting from automation. Um, so I think rather than reinvent the wheel, the aim would be to work in partnership to, to uh, gain insight and knowledge from, from their findings and then to for the agencies to be able to touch those companies that could benefit from automation. Right, thank you. And Dean Lockhart, follow-up? Yeah, just a, div a general question. Uh, have we reached the, the end of the questions? Well, if you put the question perhaps briefly and then... Well, just an observation that a number of the initiatives and measures you're setting out are welcome and, and very sensible uh, measures, but it kind of begs the question in terms of what was happening previously. Was there a, a lack of strategic direction and a, no alignment between the agencies? What, what's your observation in terms of what's been happening before? Is this personal or from the strategic... <laughs> <laughs> um, well, position to answer that question. Yeah, well, yes, I mean, and I, and I did to an extent the, the last time um, I, I appeared at the committee. My uh, initial observation um, was, and I asked the um, the well, the analytic unit and, and government um, a, a departments to give us some evidence around um, what had happened in a sector-based approach. And I think, as I said before, what we saw quite clearly was, um, well, the reason for asking was because the board, I wanted the board to understand what the future um, analytical uh, or analytics round about the, the sectors we'd looked at would be. Um, we didn't have that predictive information, so I asked for the um, the information to go back five years, then ten years, so that we could see what the trend was. The trend showed clearly that within six of the seven sectors that had been looked at, there was no real substantial economic growth. So I think that, um, personally, I think that approach was rather flawed, because high growth can come from anywhere. <coughs> um, it doesn't need to come from a sector. It can come from a different place, region, um, or different type of industry. Um, but, you know, there are always debates about which way, you know, if there was, some people always say, you know, well, you need to go for the next big thing and you need to put all your money in that. The reality is we don't know actually what the next big thing is. So one way is as good as another till you monitor it and evidence it. My challenge would be around why did we do it for so long without deciding that we were going to review it and change course or maybe do more or less of one particular area. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, that concludes this session, so I'll suspend the meeting. We'll move into... Uh, sorry, we're not, I think, moving into private session no. yet. Um, we'll suspend briefly to allow our witnesses yeah. to leave. Item four on the agenda is the European Union Structural and Investment Fund's EU Exit Regulations 2018. The committee has been asked to consider a notification from the Scottish Government relating to the European Union uh, Structural and Investment Fund's EU Exit Regulations 2018. 
This notification relates to arrangements for the regulations for structural funds, which are the rules governing the funds and which give powers to the Secretary of State uh, or a devolved authority to ensure the operability of eligible projects. In the event of a no-deal withdrawal of the UK, these regulations will no longer be operable and the programme would be administered domestically. Funding would come from the Treasury Guarantee, a commitment that all funding already committed for projects before the UK leaves the EU will be honoured. The relevant regulations are being partially or fully revoked as set out in the notification. Is the committee content for these issues to be dealt with by statutory instrument laid at Westminster? Yes. Um, thank you very much. Uh, the committee being content, I will write to the minister to notify him of the committee's decision. And at that stage, I will suspend this meeting and move into private session. <laughs>